And that is the subject of the message today. Our hearts are hungry for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll apologize at the beginning. We don't have a sermon PowerPoint today, and that is my fault. Because I sent it to Miss Joyce in a wrong fashion, and she sent it on in a wrong fashion. And so the problem is me. Now, my little line laughing. Amen. We are in John chapter 6. We're beginning the series this morning. About the I Am Sayings and the book of John. There are several. When you read the commentaries, they say that there are seven of the I Am Sayings, but by my count, there are more than that. And I don't know exactly um, what to do on that, but I'll just relate that to you. The last one, today is I'm the bread of life. And the last one, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And that's how we're going to end after uh, seven weeks here on our series. Uh, there are some general ideas and in the I am sayings. And so there's some repetition in this. And I'll just tell you that going in. Uh, but the general ideas, idea is, I am, this is Jesus talking. I am what you need. I am what you need. So you can go to sleep if you'd like to at this point because it's all about I am what you need. In the Old Testament, we have bread there. The bread of the man and the words. Do you remember that? Man means what is it? When they went outside and found it the first time, they said, what is it? And so that's why it's called man there. They didn't know. In the New Testament, you have the feeding of the 5,000, and then you have the feeding of the 4,000. We'll be looking at the feeding of the 5,000 today and talk about the 4,000 as well. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily prayer. There it is again. And then when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was blood and bread there at the Lord's Supper. So our scripture for today is John 6, we'll read 5 through 14. And then skip over and read verse 35. And almost all of the scriptures that I'll be reading or sharing with you today are from John 6. It's a long chapter, but not all. So leave your Bibles out. Leave your Bibles open. I'm going to be reading, and I'll give you an opportunity to get there uh, as we get there ourselves. So John 6, stand, let's read God's word together. John 6, verse 5 is where we start. 6, 5. And Jesus looked up. And saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. That's Jesus testing Philip. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how, will, how far will they go among so many, Jesus said. Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the, the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Obviously, if there are 5,000 men, it's a bigger crowd than 5,000. There are women, and there are also children there, and uh, they come out to eat. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were sealed, excuse me, seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, that nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces that are five barrios left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who was to come. Father, we thank you for your word. We know, God, that often we don't know what it means. And so we pray for your special work in our hearts to let us know what it means. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start off with feeding facts today. There are 5,000 5, feedings in the Bible, and then there are 4,000 feedings in the Bible. I will say this, and I want to go to great lengths to make this point, because we live in a critical age. A lot of people are criticizing the church, and even more people, I believe, are criticizing God's Word, the Bible. And they say that this is just one miracle, 
the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 on one miracle, they just couldn't remember how many there were, and you could understand how they might criticize in that way. So they remembered wrong. That's the whole idea. And so they made some mistakes, and therefore we have to look at the Bible as having mistakes made by the people who wrote it down. But when you look at the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke, there are five loaves and two fishes. There are 12 baskets left over. In John, we just read, there are five loaves and two fishes and 12 baskets left over. In Mark, there are five loaves and two fishes and 12 baskets uh, left over. Am I getting monotonous here? One more gospel. In Mark, Matthew 14, there are five loaves, two fishes, 12 baskets left over. In that coincidence, the same number of people, the same number of loaves, and the same number of baskets left over. Well, that's the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 4,000 is only reported twice in Scripture, once in Matthew and once in Mark. Mark's, uh, excuse me, Matthew 15, seven loaves, and it says a few fishes. It doesn't say a specific number. Seven baskets left over. Mark 8, Mark 8, seven loaves. And a few fishes, doesn't give a number, and seven baskets left over. Isn't that a marvelous <coughs> coincidence that in both of those areas, the feeding of the five and the feeding of the four, everything is exactly the same, down to the number in both uh, places, the feeding of the five and the feeding of the four. Now, if that's not enough, uh, in Matthew 16, if you want to look there, you can. If you don't want to look there, I'll read it to you. <coughs> I don't uh, ever advise that you trust me. I advise that you read it for yourself. Amen. amen. Thank you so much. Well, that, that was an amen for don't trust me. You have the Bible in your hand. And you can read it for yourself. Look at Matthew 16, verse 6. This is what it says. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It is because... We didn't have any bread. In other words, enough bread to feed people. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves or the five thousand, how many baskets you gather? Or the seven loaves, same numbers, for the four thousand, how many baskets you gather? How is it you don't understand? that I was not talking to you about bread. So there, in one verse, you have the 5,000 mentioned and the 4,000 mentioned. I think that the people who criticize us and criticize the Bible should just read the Bible. Amen. Amen? Wouldn't that be wonderful if we just looked at what the Bible actually said? Verse 14 in John 6 said they began to believe. But it also says there that they began to believe that he was a prophet. They're not to the place where they believed he was Messiah yet. That comes later, but they didn't believe it at that time. I, and, and there's a sermon in that before we move on. Here's the sermon in that. People usually come to Jesus by steps and stages. They believe a little, but they don't believe. And they believe a little, and they don't believe. It is your and my job to help them to take whatever next step there would be until they come to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, where they repent of their sins, own Jesus as the Messiah, the anointed one of God, invite them into, his, into their hearts and change their lifestyle, or begin to change their lifestyle, because changing lifestyles is by steps and starts and stages as well. So there's some feeding facts. I have those down on paper. I decided, um, made an executive decision. Not to give out that paper this morning, but if you want that paper, I'll give it to you, and if you'll give me a day or two. So that's the first thing, the feeding facts. Secondly, the question is asked often, why feed them? And the first answer is compassion. When he looked at these people, in one place in the Word, it says they were faint. In other words, they had not eaten. Some of you get a little lightheaded when you haven't eaten, and so perhaps that's the way the people were. And it wasn't just the five, because that was 5,000 men. There were women and children there, too. And so what you can get from this is that Jesus has compassion 
about your physical, material needs. He cared that these people were faint. And so he made bread. One gospel says just send them away. That's the disciples' way to answer this problem. Just send them away. And Jesus was a little concerned about them leaving with a faint stomach there. <coughs> it was Andrew who said, well, it would take eight months' wages to feed these people. Enough for them to have, if you notice, a mouthful. Not a meal, but a mouthful. It would take eight months' wages. The Bible tells us repeatedly that Jesus is moved with compassion. And if you don't have that kind of compassion, you're not close enough to Jesus. Because if you're close to Jesus, you begin to become like Jesus. And begin. And one of the elements of who Jesus was, was he cared. He really cared. We have a, a saying, who cares? Well, Jesus cared. And if you become like him, you'll care too. One of the reasons we go into all the world is because the all, all the world matters to Jesus. He came to save the entire world. We forget that, but he was moved with compassion. Chapter 6 and verse 26, uh, John, I'm back to John now, he talks to them about confrontation. He confronts people who came just for the other. Isn't this interesting? You thought that was a common phenomenon today, that when people just come for the food. No, no, it's been around for a long, long time because people are always just going to be people. John chapter 6 Verse 26, and I'll read 27 as well. This is what it says. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. You were looking for me, not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Now, if we want a good crowd, and for some Southern Baptist Church, all we got to do is feed. Amen? Let's have a big amen for food. Amen. Boy, that's the best amen we've ever had. <laughs> we all like to eat, don't we? Well, it's not a new thing. It's been around for ages. And you can imagine, especially poor people, would be attracted to this kind of ministry. But that's what it says in verse 26, 27. Jesus went on to exhort them. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So he moves from liberal food. To the spiritual food that we all need. He understood that though. Jesus was no dummy. He understood why people came and why they didn't come there. He focuses on food here, but not just the food. And Jesus was not fooled. And he's not fooled even today. And he says, verse 27, there's more to life than food. He could have said, there's more to life than a good house. There's more to life than that special ride that you spend your time in. You know, a lot of people get off on the ride, you know, the vehicle that they ride in. But you know, vehicles rust, don't they? They tear up on a regular basis. Does your vehicle tear up on a regular basis? Amen. How many of you this month have had a vehicle to tear up? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah. I'm riding in a loader right now. Amen? Because a little part about this big tore up, and we're still waiting on the part for that vehicle to come in. And so that problem happens all the time. So he not only defended the people because of compassion, but he confronted them. And then in verse 27, he explained what he was doing. We just read it a second ago. Bread is a symbol or the figure for all material things in life. Everything that you can touch, your garden, your flowers, your car, the desk that you work out from time to time, the carpet that you walk on, everything is material. That bread is a symbol of that. And Jesus said in 27, don't labor for that bread. Labor for something that is much more important than that bread. Some of us are consumed with things. And the more things that we have, the better we feel about ourselves. There's a certain lift, uh, kind of an adrenaline boost when you get to buy something, isn't there? And sometimes that gets so heavy on us that we just buy things when we really don't have the money for that. And I get it. I understand, but you're just a human being. So he says it this way. All that bread is for the body, I am for the soul. Let me say that again because that's kind of the crux of what we're talking about. 
everything that the bread is for the body. And you, you've got bread in everything. You've got crackers. You've got donuts. You've got cake. You've got toast. You've got sandwiches. Amen? You've got pretzels. I can go on all day. There's bread absolutely everywhere. In fact, we might say we need bread. In a way, physically we need it, but we might say literally, even though we need bread materially, we need Jesus spiritually. Just like bread is to the body, so Jesus is to the soul. And then there's a fulfilled prophecy uh, in this passage here as well. Jesus said, thirdly, I am that bread. In verse 35, 47 through 48 and 51, I'm not going to read these, but four times in this passage, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And it kind of makes you wonder if that's what he was driving at all along, and I believe it is. The idea is not the feeding of the folks with liberal bread, but the receiving of Jesus, who is the spiritual bread, the real bread of life. He said that three times. So it's not about the literal bread, not about the food, the material. In fact, they fulfilled the prophecy that they were looking for. The Jews felt like that when the Messiah came, that he would make bread in the same way Moses did in the Old Testament. Don't look at me that way. Read verse 30 through 34 with me. Same chapter, John 6, 30 through 34. Then we find it, and we'll read it from there. So it says, so they asked him, what miraculous sign did will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers gave the manna in the desert. That was their miracle. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. We could go on, but we'll stop right there. In other words, first, it wasn't Moses that gave you that bread. It was God that gave you bread. And not only that, I'm paraphrasing what Jesus said. Not only that, the true bread of life is the Lord Jesus Christ in our spirits, in our soul. He was more. He is living bread. Because you have a greater hunger than your physical hunger. I know we all get hungry. I know that we all like to eat. In fact, in the South, eating is our favorite sport. Right? I don't know of any state except for uh, over Alabama, except for Texas, that's heavier than Alabama. I'll just put it that way. I believe Texas is the heaviest state. People over eat more in Texas than they do in Alabama. But we like to eat. And there's really no sin in that for a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, but there are in supposed in other ways. But it's not about church. Let me get back to the main thing. It's not about church. It's about Jesus. If you put your faith in church, that's not a bad thing, necessarily, but it's not the best. It's not about church, it's about Jesus. It's not about worship, even. It's about Jesus, who comes to us or speaks to us when we all get together. In worship, it's about the Jesus of worship. It's not about some cause that we all get lined up with. It's certainly not all about politics. You know, if you allow yourself and get kind of, you slide into a particular political stance or particular political party, for the record, all that changes year after year. Sometimes within a year, it all changes. It's not about that. It's about Jesus. It's not about the material. How many televisions you have in your house? Some of us are old enough to remember when we didn't have a television at all. And then we had black and white. And then we not only had one in this living room, we had one in the dining room. And then we graduated to one in every single bedroom. Amen? Amen. You feel my pain? Because now we have them in the cars, right? How do people drive and watch TV at the same time? Well, the, the answer, the short answer to that is, they don't drive well. That's the short answer. And if that TV in the television in the car is not enough, now we've got TV on our phones, right? So that we can drive looking at our phones, looking at the TV, and have more breaks, right? We used to say don't drink and drive, and now we say don't drive distracted because of all of this. But just exactly how many televisions is enough? Well, there's never enough. And that could be a kind of a symbol of all of the things that we have. How many bedrooms is enough bedrooms? How many closets is enough closets? How many cars is enough cars? I remember when our 
children who were getting older and we took five cars every Sunday morning to church. <laughs> <laughs> the deacon started griping about not being enough parking and I didn't say anything about the fact that my family was bringing five every week. The only thing that would have been better is five cars with a trailer behind it. <laughs> right? So that we can take all our stuff with us because we know we love our stuff. Listen, let me, let me kind of draw this to a conclusion here on this particular point. Some of us are hungry. And we think that the material things in life are going to feed our hunger. And they do for a nanosecond. And then it's gone. Some of us are hungry, so we feed that hunger. I'm talking about a spiritual hunger. We feed that hunger with drugs or alcohol or the latest thing that kind of makes you have an adrenaline rush, whatever it is. And it works for just that long, doesn't it? When a person takes drugs, they get up with the drugs, you know what they want? More drugs. Because that's the way it is. Jesus is talking about something that is bigger, better than all that. Bread is a simple thing. There's no pizzazz about bread. Did you notice their reaction down here while I've done it? You know what they said, kind of? Well, it's just bread. Yeah, it's just bread. So in a sense, Jesus doesn't have that kind of pizzazz, but he does fill our needs. Bread is basic. He didn't say, I'm giving you the cake of life. I'm giving you the donuts of life. I'm giving you the cupcakes of life. All of which are bread. It's just bread. Jesus said, taught us about, he took bread as an example. Because bread is needed. We have to have it to live. The spiritual journey of life lets you know that you can be hungry in your life. And nothing satisfies but Jesus. Nothing hits the spot. Have you ever had this experience? You drink coats, you drink coats, you drink coats, and then you turn around and you drink water and you go, that's what I needed all along. It is what you needed all along. And Jesus Christ is in some way. The need for bread is an ongoing, daily thing. You cannot eat enough on Sunday to make it through to the next Sunday, can you? No, you need to eat every single day. Better than that, you need to eat three times a day. And Jesus is the same way. Our world, guys, is hungry. But they're not hungry for material things. Some of the poorest people that I know are the happiest people I know. And some of the most satisfied people I know are the people who have found what they were looking for all along. And I'm saying to you this morning, if you don't remember anything else I'd say, remember this. Jesus is what you're hungry for. Jesus is what you need. Nothing, nothing, nothing will satisfy. He fulfills our need for meaning in life. What's it all about? Without Jesus, it's about the next loaf of bread. That's what it's all about. Jesus satisfies our need, our need to belong. You need to belong. One of the reasons that people get together in groups and do things is because we like to belong. But I want you to know something. I want you to remember this. Jesus loves you like no friend you've ever had will ever love. Jesus loves you better than your mother or your father loves you. He loves you. That satisfies me. When we are lonely, not if we are lonely, when we are lonely, he is there. Billy Graham used to say that the most common need that he encountered as he did all of his crusades was the, the need of loneliness. If you are lonely, you're not alone in that either. All people are lonely. Only Jesus can satisfy that need at its next level. If you're afraid, Jesus Christ can comfort you. If you're confused, Jesus Christ says, follow me, I'll be your shepherd. I will lead you to where you need to be. If you're burdened with your needs or your guilt or your responsibilities, he surely teaches us in real life, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Not just your guilt, or your sin burdens, but all the burdens of life. If you're bruised, Jesus is your comforter. Jesus can help you be, uh, become well again and whole again. If you've lived a wasted life, Jesus will allow you a fresh start. If you've not been up with Jesus up until today, today's your day to change that. And you may look over your shoulder and realize that it's all wasted up until this point. It can change. 
if you allow Jesus to be your all in all, if you live in hopelessness and despair, no, no future out there, Jesus can give you a future. Not necessarily just in this life, but in the life to come. There's a future there. So people are hungry. They really are. If we were to get on a plane and go to South America, people would be hungry. If we were moved from there to Asia, people would be hungry. Europe, people would be hungry. And they're all hungry for the same thing. The bread of life. The Lord Jesus Christ. Winning witness, not if you witness. Winning witness and share Jesus. You can share with the confidence that the people that you're talking to are hungry. And they need what you found. And that person you found is Jesus Christ. Jesus satisfies our hunger. His forgiveness satisfies. His presence fulfills us. He fills your greatest need. We don't really know sometimes what we need. Right? If, if, if you were to get really honest, and I were to get really honest, and we were to have an honesty talk, and I would say to you, what, what would it take to make you really happy? Well, some of you would name something. But a lot of you would say, well, I just really don't know what it would take to make you really happy. I do. Jesus. He's your bread. He's what you really need. And when you have the bread that fulfills that inner spiritual need, you will not need or lust after as much all these other needs that we've talked about this morning. Because you'll have something. Not for the future, not in heaven. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about right now. If I were to say what would make you happy, you might say, I'd be happy if I had a, a great business and we made great money. Well, I'll say this. You'll never make enough money. Right? You achieve your goal? Will it be enough if you achieve your goal? No. Let me just fast forward. In fact, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again this morning. I pray, or I hope, that the Lord would give you a million dollars. I'm waiting. Amen. You know why? Because once you get a million, you're going to want two. And then once you get two, you're going to want three. It'll never be enough. I'd be happy if all my health problems went away. Well, join the human race. All of us don't walk through life, we live through life. And almost everybody has health issues. And it only gets worse as you get older. Can I have an amen from the senior at all? <laughs> everybody said, oh me, right? I'd be happy if I, I had um, good relationships. And probably one of those good relationship areas is your family life. Well, your family can really love you, and they do really love you and take care of you. But your family's not always going to be there. They could move to Timbuktu, or they could do the worst thing in the world and just go ahead and die on you, you know? Families do that. That's the way people are. And there is no substitute. Let me say this while I'm on family. There's no substitute in your family for a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your family cannot be your God. And if you're expecting them to, you're expecting the wrong thing. They're just folks. They're just people. But Jesus is not. Jesus is what you need. Don't substitute family for Jesus. I'd be happy if I could accomplish something, make a success, beat my challenges. Yeah. But if you met your challenges, there's another one. Follow the heels on it. Isn't there? Always in life. So Jesus helps us with all that. Jesus satisfies our hunger. If you're hungry this morning, I'm going to say that's a good thing. And I'm not talking about food that we eat at noon on Sunday morning. I'm talking about something that's not more important. Could it be that the Lord God himself has placed that hunger in your heart? Has placed it there so that you will seek him out and find him and be saved. And begin that walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. You walk all the way through life and then into the next life. John chapter 6 verse 53 we're going to go to the end of the chapter here, almost to the end. Listen to what it says. Jesus said to them, this is a long chapter, it has 71 verses. At the end, Jesus said to them, I'll tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food,
And my blood is your drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I am him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so one who feeds on me will live because of me. Listen, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate man and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Shades of the Lord's Supper, right? Sounds just like the Lord's Supper in John chapter 6. I thought that was given at the end of his ministry. It absolutely was given at the end of his ministry. But the truth is the truth is the truth from John 1 all the way to John 21. Right? And the bottom line is, I know what your hunger is for. You need Jesus. <laughs> Nothing else that you're trying to put in that hole in your soul will ever feed you will ever satisfy you, will ever sustain you, but Jesus Christ. You may not even know what you need. And so that's why I'm telling you. You need Jesus. Start there, and when that hole in your soul is filled with the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be able to handle all these other needs of life that we all have. Father, I pray you bless us now. As we consider allowing you to be the Lord of our life, I pray that you'd help us to make whatever decision you've already laid on our hearts. Some of us came this morning with knowing that we had a hold of our soul. I would ask God that you help those people to trust Jesus <coughs> as what they're looking for. I ask God for those of us who trusted Jesus a long time ago. That you give us the grace that we need to reprioritize, recenter, and re understand that it is Him that makes all the difference in the world. You are.